David, uh, David Long, we don't really know each other personally, but I've enjoyed um, your voice when I have come across it in various integral communities on the uh, intertubes. But uh, in this video here, um, Integral 2.0, the upgrade, it almost felt like um, you were deliberately trying to trigger me. So I had to put on my, my integral lenses to regain focus. Um, and I think there's a lot in what you were saying that I agree with. This, this call to take reality seriously, to attend to suffering and impermanence, and not to spiritually bypass suffering and impermanence. Uh, I, I, I take seriously, like you do, the idea that science is not a fairy tale. Uh, you know, reality is not a dream. Nature is not just Maya. Nature is also the unfolding of an idea, or or, or a, a law, if you prefer. There's a an order to the chaos, which is why it's a cosmos, and um, we can know something about that order through certain methods. Um, and you know, I pluralize methods. There's there's not just one science there's many 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 sciences uh, science when practiced well gives rise to new sciences i mean that's that's the whole name of the game so the the reason though that i feel i i felt triggered by some of the things you were saying is that you know while i would want to honor honor science i would also want to honor the idealist uh, philosophical school going back to what i guess plato i mean wherever we want to start it we could we could begin in india and in the vedic traditions if we prefer idealism has ancient roots and indeed is associated with a sort of a sense of mystical monism absorption into the godhead such that any finite particular difference is in fact an illusion that ultimately um, dissolves into the one, the unity of of the universal. And I think I prefer realism and pluralism for some of the same reasons that um, David was defending. Well, ultimately, you know, for me, metaphysically, I oppose realism to idealism, um, and I oppose pluralism to monism. I also think that uh, it is absolutely necessary for me to continue to think with the idealist tradition. If I can't think with Kant and Fichte and Schelling and Hegel and Goethe uh, and Schiller and Novalis and the Schlegel brother, like if I can't think with these philosophers about the nature of reality, then I'm missing a whole bunch of it. And not just a whole bunch of it, I'm missing the whole, I'm missing the, the all, um, the universal again, right? So I think idealism owns the sense of the universal and the import of ideas. Ideas shape reality. No one can deny that. Even a materialist cannot deny that, at least in the case of the human being, somehow scientific ideas have come to uh, shape reality. If, if they haven't, then science is a fairy tale. So um, ideas are real. So for, for me as a realist, uh, I'm not so much obsessed with uh, the dissolution into the one idea as I am in the proliferation of many ideas. Because um, ultimately reality itself is a... Uh, adventure of ideas, you know, to use Alfred North Whitehead's phrase. And uh, when we, when I assert that that realism is more um, in accord with the nature of things than idealism, it doesn't discount the reality of ideas. What it says is, 
is that we need to be engaged with what is actually happening. Abstract ideas uh, that don't partake in embodied aesthetic um, actualization are really not that important. They're, they're irrelevant. What we want are, are ideas that are incarnate uh, in things, in, in, in bodies, in lives. We want ideas that are embodied in, expressed by persons, personalities, souls. Uh, you know, a soul is not some abstract, disembodied uh, notion. The soul of a human being is very much the, the form of the body of that human being. <clears throat> it, it is, uh, the body is not incidental, right? The face of the person is not incidental, but uh, essential to the nature of the soul. Like, that is the soul. The face of a human being is the soul, the body of a human being is the soul of a person expressing itself. And I think we can still talk, even as modern, enlightened, you know, secular, intellectual people, we can still talk about souls. We have to. We don't have any alternatives. Um, So I guess the reason that I felt a little bit triggered was that um, I felt that the idealist tradition was being dismissed. I didn't hear any specific arguments from you, um, David, about what, you know, clearly you weren't, I don't think, talking to like Kant or Schelling or something. You were talking to some um, caricature of an idealist that thinks that suffering is an, is an illusion and we can all just transcend to eternity without having to worry about any of the earthly shit, the suffering, the impermanence that we're faced with every day. Clearly, um, that's escapist. Clearly, we need to be engaged in the everyday practice of transforming ourselves and doing our best to lift up the community of beings on this planet. Um, and, you know, you really took a, a swing at, you know, what I would call panpsychism. Maybe you would dismiss it as animism or um, anthropomorphism or um, some kind of a, uh, it would be a, a pre-trans fallacy mistake, right? For someone nowadays, with all the scientific knowledge that we have about nature to be a panpsychist would be silly, right? I think from your perspective, and that's triggering to me because I don't think it's silly at all. I think the best integration of the various sciences which have emerged over the last few hundred years in their attempt to characterize nature, to mathematize it, to quantify it, uh, to measure and subdue it technologically to the extent possible. Um, I think the best interpretation of all of that data and all of those successful theories is in fact a panpsychist cosmology. And I've, I've written um, at length about this, and I'm happy to share that with anyone. So I think we need to not dismiss idealism or panpsychism. I think we not we need to not um, think of language as something that we can simply master, and like we choose the symbols that we want to work with to like aim in a specific level of consciousness that we, from a higher level, think we detect in someone else. Um, language is not like that, I don't think. I think language, we don't possess language, it possesses us. And to the extent that there is collective intelligence and collaborative evolution, it's because language itself has a genius that works through us, despite us often, but through us. Um, we are the support system for the evolution of this, this logos, this um, divine intelligence that is fully embodied, incarnate. It lives and breathes and it dies with us, but it also carries on because we are a community, right? We are not single, isolated individuals. Our consciousness is not just a brain secretion that disappears when this brain decays. You know, we, we really are plugged into a universal consciousness. And the trick is to 
you know, learn to participate in that fact in a way that's not narcissistic and um, hubristic, right? And, and that's what science is ultimately, learning to see together what is actually going on here between us um, and within us and among us. Like, let's pay attention to all of this together. And so I would invite you, David, maybe not, maybe not to a, de a debate, but I'd love to just discuss, to dialogue about um, what's at stake when we dismiss idealism, like as a as an abstract block or some set of caricatures that we have in order to affirm what as an alternative materialism? I mean, are you really saying that blind, dumb matter is the base of all reality and consciousness accidentally emerged out of that? Um, and that there's no deeper meaning, no uh, telos, no, no cosmic purpose. Um, you know, I think there are ways of talking about the evolution of consciousness uh, as something not merely reducible to matter that don't require us to say that matter is created by consciousness. Uh, I don't think that's true any more than I think that it's possible to understand how consciousness could be created by matter. If you think that consciousness could be created by matter, I'd like you to show your work. I mean, like you were saying, prove it. I haven't seen evidence that that's even possible conceptually. Um, certainly no one is trying to build a machine that's going to do it. I, I think anyone who is is going to fail, and indeed the history of AI research is a history of failure. I'm not saying something like a supercomputer that would control the world wouldn't be possible, but is it? Is it actually conscious? It just might just be, you know, really a bunch of algorithms and a, a more like an egregore. The human, a certain class of technocrats have conjured into existence. It's not doesn't have interior agency itself. It's just something that has been imbued with the agency that it possesses by this team of tech technicians. So um, I don't think you can explain how consciousness emerges from matter. I don't think you can explain how matter might emerge from consciousness either. So don't get me wrong. But I think we need to coordinate these perspectives in order to move forward in the evolution of our consciousness, because we, we can't just eliminate one side of this, um, of this philosophical debate. So how do we integrate idealism and materialism? Maybe that's a dialogue, a discussion topic that we might want to have. Uh, so look forward to hearing back from you later. <clears throat>